My mother treasured the book, W. Byford Jones, written in 1937. Shropshire Haunts of Mary Webb, which was published by the local publishers Wildings. And she was so fond of mentioning Mary Webb to me. As a boy, I often visited Bowmere Pool, where her precious bane is based. Uh, this was before its development and was then a very forbading place. Uh, with tales of the sunken church, a giant fish with a sword strapped to it that we simply called a monster, uh, and of Wild Edric. Indeed, the BBC adaptation of the book came out when I was a teenager. But like so many, I assumed it to be Ellesmere in Shropshire and not Bowmere Pool, which, of course, I knew so well. As a teenager, I also used to pass her home, Spring Cottage, on Lith Hill so regularly. Nevertheless, I have to admit that as a teenager I was more interested in the girls from the school which bore her name than in the author herself. I did, however, great, develop a great love for the English romantics, whom Mary has some continuity with, and indeed for Thomas Hardy, whom she is often compared to. Uh, but as a young man, when VHS became popular, I would watch David's Lean's film, Gone to Earth Religiously. Uh, maybe because I had a departed uncle who I met, I did meet him once, who had lived below Bromlow Callow, or the Callow as it is called in, in, uh, in the film. Especially I would watch it when returning home from a rave during what I called my chill out. You see, Mary taps into a rural animism, and what today, uh, what today would be called an, called anti-capitalism, I guess. Uh, and, that, and these were the backdrop to my youth. Uh, this anti-capitalism is is very hard to explain. It, it's more a sort of a rural anarchism. But you see, rural, Shropshire's rural population of often voted Conservative, or generally voted Conservative. In many respects, this sort of feeling is one of true Conservatism. It expresses itself more through humour and scepticism of those in power and seeking profit maximisation. One might call them rural rebels without a cause, uh, but they did have a cause. And not a logical way of expressing it in post-enlightenment Britain. And to quote from Precious Bane, I've thought since that when folks grumble about this and that and not be happy, it is there, it, it, it is not the fault of creation. That is the vast mere full of good. But it is the fault of their bucket of smallness. Mary was born Mary Gladys Meredith. Uh, in fact, she was actually known as Gladys to her family. In um, 18, 1881, at Leighton Lodge in, uh, in the Shropshire village of Leighton, where she was baptised at St Mary's Parish Church, um, her Welsh father, George Edward Meredith, or Meredith, um, was an Oxford graduate and a private school teacher. Indeed, he had a small boarding school at Leighton Lodge. He inspired his daughter with his love of literature and local countryside, and Mary explored the countryside around her childhood home and developed a sense of detailed observation and description of, of places, but also of people. And her poem, Green Rain, is, is well, it's so beautiful. In the scented wood we'll go and see the blackthorn swim in snow. High above the budding leaves, a broading dove awakes and grieves. The glades with mingled music stare and wildly laughs the woodkeep woodpecker. With blackthorn petals pearl the breeze, the, there are the twisted hawthorn trees. 
thick set with buds as clear and pale as golden water or golden hail, as if a storm of ra rain had stood enchanted in the thorny wood, and hearing fairy voices call, hung poised, forgetting how to fall. In fact, Mary became a vegetarian as a child, and but loathed the slaughter of animals. She was a champion of the nonconformists and the underdogs. She defended the rights of the individual against societal pressures and expressed an intuitive awareness of the collective unconsciousness of humanity. Uh, the past is only the present, becomes invisible and mute, and because it is invisible and mute, it memorises, glances and murmurs uh, infinitely pressure. We are tomorrow's past, and that was from Precious Bane. Her mother, Sarah Alice, was from Edinburgh and said to be descended from Sir Walter Scott. At the age of one, she moved to Much Wenlock, where she lived at the house called The Grange, just outside the town. Mary was taught by her father and then sent to finishing school for girls in Southport in 1895. Her parents moved again in Shropshire, north of Stanton upon Hine Heath in 1896, before settling in 1902 at Meal Brace in Shrewsbury, where indeed my parents moved to when I was away at university. At the age of 20, she developed symptoms of Graves' disease. This resulted in ill health throughout her life, including a neck goiter and protruding eyes, and contributed to her early death. As a girl, she wrote plays and stories to entertain her five younger sisters and brothers. And Mary's first was uh, a five, uh, first published writing was a five worst verse poem. Uh, written on here in the news of the Shrewsbury Rail Accident of October 1907, her brother Kenneth Meredith um, so liked the poem and thought it potentially comforting to those afflicted by the disaster that without her knowledge he took it to the newspaper offices of the Shropshire Chronicle, which printed the poem anonymously. On the 12th of June 1912, uh, Webb married Henry Burton Law Webb, 1885 to 1939, a nephew of the, in, well, the famous Cap Ma Captain Matthew Webb, the channel sit swimmer. And I, I was always brought up on the song that I find out is actually, it's called The Shropshire Lad, and I always thought it was from Houseman. Uh, but the words are actually by Sir John Betjeman. And it goes... Uh, the gas was on in the institute, the flare was up in the gym, and the man was running a mineral line, and a lass was singing a hymn, when Captain Webb, the Dorley man, Captain Webb from Dorley, came swimming along the old canal that carried the bricks to Lawley, swimming along, swimming along, swimming along from seven, paying a call at Dorley, the bike was swimming along to heaven. <laughs> And of course, Dorley is very close to Wellington, where the first witch's ladder was discovered in the UK. <laughs> the wedding guests, or the guests to her wedding, actually caused quite a stare as she'd invited 70-year-old and destitute people, many from the women's ward of Crosshouses Workhouse, and she'd indeed ordered a large trap to transport her guests from Atcham to Meal. Now, Henry was a teacher at Meal Brace Holy Trinity Parish Church School. And at first he supported her literary interests. They lived for a time in Western Super Mare before moving back to Shropshire. Where he gained work as a market gardeners until Henry secured a job as a teacher. First at Chester and then at the Priory Grammar School for Boys in Shrewsbury, which, as you possibly know, is the very school that both I and my father attended. Uh, they lived briefly at Rose Cottage in Hinton Lane in the Nils in Pontsbury between 1914 and 1916. 
a village that I know very well because my aunt and uncle are from there and I used to spend every Christmas day there at the very least. And it was during this time that she wrote, wrote The Golden Arrow. Uh, the publication of The Golden Arrow in 1917 enabled them to move to Lith Hill, which is a part of Baston Hill, I suppose. And she absolutely loved it. And they bought a plot of land called Spring Cottage. <laughs> Again, I lived on the Lith Hill side of Baston Hill and it, I used to walk past Spring Cottage all the time. In 1921, they bought a second property in London in the hope that by being in the city, they could achieve greater literary recognition. Uh, but by 1927, she was suffering increasingly bad health. Her marriage was failing and she returned to Spring Cottage alone. It's believed that Henry was having a relationship with an ex-pupil. And to quote from The Golden Arrow, to many women, marriage is only this... It's merely a physical change, impinging on the ordinary nature, leaving their mentality untouched, their self-possession intact. Uh, they're not burned by even the red fire of physical passion, far less by the white fire of love. Uh, and sadly she died, age 46, at St Leonard's on Sea in Sussex, but she is buried at Shrewsbury Cemetery, uh, on the Longdon Road uh, and uh, fitting that we should quote her nature's music is never over uh, her silences a pause is not conclusions now Mary was heavily influenced by Charlotte Byrne and her jointly authored book of 1883 Shropshire Folklore, a sheaf of gleanings, who when discussing the people, people of Shropshire's beliefs said that it would be easier to alienate them from church than to weaken them in their faith in witchcraft. And now despite fellow vlogger third-rate content publishing a vlog on the witch trials in Shrewsbury, such persecution was relatively rare, rare in Wales and the Marshes, and indeed in Ireland. Scotland and Northern influence, uh, England were influenced by James I and his infamous campaign against witchcraft, and even more infam infamously the Southern and Eastern England by Michael Hopkins, the so-called Witchfinder General. Indeed, the Stiper Stones, and particularly Snail Beach, had a long tradition of witchcraft, which by Mary's time had merged with nonconformity. I need to say that this is this is very close to Ponsbury, where, of course, she had lived. Uh, this tradition goes back at least to the Black Death, when labour shortages offered the opportunity for serfs to rebel against their masters. And Snell Beach became a centre for these runaway serfs, unaffected by the laws of the manor and the established church. Uh, but maybe the also the Stiperstone's location along the Welsh border and its inhabitants equally at the crossroads of Welsh and English culture. Indeed, a good many of the lead miners were from Montgomeryshire. And although a comparatively modern tradition, to this day Minsterly still has an Eisteddfod. Certainly... Witchcraft and cunning folk were common in 19th century Shropshire. During Mary's time, there certainly still would have been many people who described themselves as cunning folk. Even as a child, I remember gypsy families who were consulted on all sorts of issues by rural families, like Hazel's mother was in Gone to Earth. And indeed, as a child, I remember them still calling door to door, selling pegs and sprigs of heather, and reputedly cursing those who refused to buy them. And then there were cunning women living in the Shropshire Hills, who by then we had begun to call herbalists. <laughs> Strangely enough, this is a tradition that I continue today in my mountain home in Java, lacking adequate medical provision I grow medicinal herbs for myself my family and the villagers I also make a, a drink a herbal tonic um, 
uh, every day, which is known as Jammu. And as Professor Ronald Hutton commented, uh, the cunning craft, rather than dying out, changed character. As some of its traditional functions atrophied um, and others developed, witchcraft is still popular in Shropshire but one has to doubt the resonance it has with traditional practices. More sinisterly and the total antithesis of Mary's interests the Order of the Nine Angels chose the Shropshire border as their location with connections to Church Stretton and Bishop's Castle referring to many pre-Christian traditions which still prevailed in the area uh, maybe it's simply satanic panic by but the but the order of the nine angels was said to have practiced child sacrifice at the disused snail beach lead mines nevertheless mary was much more interested in magic and witchcraft than uh, magic and witchcraft and was, was was not so much interested in magic and witchcraft but what might be described as folklore However, animistic traditions merged with the landscape and affected the lives of everyday people in Shropshire. Precious Bane is the story of Gideon and Prusan, and it, which intersects with the local cunning man, Begildi, with whom the San family has a long-running feud. Uh, resonating with the English romantics, Mary adds the dimension of folklore to the tensions in rural Shropshire. And the novel challenges the post-Enlightenment opposition between modernity and the superstition of those whose lives are still structured around traditional ways of understanding the world. Indeed, Precious Brain represents a countryside in transition as residual transitional culture confronts a rural modernity shaped by a capitalist ideology. Uh, whilst Gideon sees working hard to gain the maximum profit from the land as, as modern, uh, Prue questions such a destructive approach to farming in Gurunkidal in Java, I witness this today where a family can feed itself off a relatively small plot of land and relatively limited work. Uh, but so many are enticed to more intensive methods to pay off loans taken out for weddings or more modern housing materials. Uh, despite Begildi's complaint that most of those who came to him were young maids with no money or old men who wanted someone cursed on the cheap. He is not called upon to curse or remove curses for anyone in the book. Almost all the requests for resistance that he receives relate to illness or injury. Even Gideon, who does not approve of the wizard, acknowledges that he, is, uh, that he has a salve for every sore. Like Mary, Begaldi points to the incorporation of animistic traditions within everyday life, rather than an alternative religion. Uh, the same could be said of Hazel in Gone to Earth, who could feel in nature things crying out as they have long while been hurted. Although Begaldi offered a ghost bottling service, for which there was still demand in Shropshire at the end of the 19th century, even being offered by some church ministers, according to Byrne. Uh, just as I today have come across Duke and bottling and burning gins in these bottles here in Indonesia. Also, as I experience in Indonesia today, Bigaldi is not respected in his community as much as his predecessors would have been, particularly by Gideon, who has embraced the instrumentalism and profit-seeking aspects of what he sees as a rural modernity. Although my father was from Liverpool, he was evacuated to Shropshire during the war, I should add, along with Ken Dodd. 
He ended up as a farm manager for the Wartime Ministry of Agriculture, or WARAG as it was known, taking over supposedly unproductive farms and farming them extensively with the abundant application of chemicals. In many respects mirroring the extensive arable techniques of large farms of the east of England, uh, whom he eulogised and modernising the traditions of Shropshire's mixed-use small holdings. Uh, but the traditionally biodiverse meadow supported a much greater range and diversity of extensive nature uh, than Gideon's more profitable monocultural landscape. As ever, war was the excuse for the destruction of traditional ways of life and indeed of economic relationships including the distribution of wealth. In fact, the dynamic between Gideon and Prue was played out within my own family, between my mother and father. A dynamic that I am only beginning to come to terms with and understand since their deaths, and maybe since becoming something of a mystical recluse in the mountains of Java. Uh, modernity often values only that which can be owned or quantified or ascribed a, a, a monetary value to, but this is not something which one sh could or should seek to quantify. Uh, for when the nuthatch comes in all, in all her own tree, she doesn't ask who planted it, nor what name it bears to men, for a tree is all to a nuthatch. And this was all to me. Uh, such attitudes spill over to all of God's creation. Jack Redding, the squire in Gone to Earth, believed that women, servants and animals were in the world only for his benefit. Whereas equally, Gideon is equally cruel to his financy, Jancis. In fact, he murders his own mother by putting hemlock in a tea when she is no longer able to work the land. And there's mother... As, as used to help a bit, no use and less than no use. A heavy burden. We'll never pick up now she's like that. Sin Eater is a person who concerns, consumes a ritual meal in order to spiritually take on the sins of the deceased person. The food was believed to absolve the sins of the recently dead person, thus absolving the soul of the person. Sin eaters, as a consequence, carried the sins of all people whose sins they had eaten. Uh, they were usually feared and sons because, shunned because they had pawned their own souls for a little bread and wine. Its origins appear to be from Wales, although... There are rumours it dates back to ancient Greece, but it was very prevalent in Shropshire. Indeed, the Encyclopaedia Britannica for 1911 stated, A symbolic survival of Sin Eaton was witnessed as recently as 1893 at Market Drayton, Shropshire. A preliminary service had been held over the coffin in the house. A woman poured out a glass of wine for each bearer and handed it to him across the coffin with a funeral biscuit. Uh, Richard Munslow, 1833 to 1906, is said to have been the last sin eater of Shropshire. Uh, but unlike most, Munslow was not poor nor outcast, instead being a wealthy farmer from an established family. In the words of the Reverend Norman Morris of Rattlinghope, or Ratchup as I know it, where Monlo, Monslow was from, and straddling the Longmind and the Stuyperstone said, it's a very odd practice and would not have been approved by the church, but I suspect the vicar often turned a blind eye to the practice. At a funeral of anyone who died without confessing their sins, a, a sinator would take on the sins for the deceased by eating a loaf of bread and drinking ale out of a wooden bowl passed over the coffin and make a sp short speech. I give easement and rest now, thee dear man, and ye not down the lanes or meadows. For thy peace I pawn my own soul. Uh, amen. In Precious Bane, Gideon is dismissive of magical, magical beliefs and prophecies. He mostly laughs at signs and bodings. 
when Prue and her brother Gideon are burying their father, the coffin is standing in the grave. The mourners had all drank good health to their father from a big pewter tankard full of elderberry wine, which was all the mother had been able to afford. Uh, But at the coffin foot was a little pewter measure full of wine and a crust of bread with it, but nobody touched them. Sexton, one of the mourners, stepped forward and asked, Be there a sin eater? And mother cried out, Alas, no! Woe, it's me! There is no sin eater for poor son! Gideon gainsayed it! Gideon can take the role of the eater for his deceased father's sins because he thinks the process is nonsense. We'll save money. What good would the man do? But his mother would not be confronted because her husband has died in wrath. All his sins upon him. He died in his boots, which is very unkent thing and bodes no good. If there's no one else to help, let alone his own lad take pity. Gideon wants to make sure that his mother will give him the family farm if he acts as the father's sin eater. Yes, yes, my dear, she says. What be the farm to me? You can take all and welcome. And thus Gideon eats his father's sins, saying, What harm a sup of one's own wine and chumble a crust of one's own bread? And in doing so, Gideon makes a Faustian pact to get the farm. His bane is gold, which he sets to acquire quite regardless of the harm he will do to others. He is, of course, cursed and doomed. Gideon becomes a monster with no morales and eventually half mad. Prue survives and lives to a happy old age, but remembers the stories, the harvest, the celebrations, and Gideon's monomania and hubris. She mourns the dead, rather like I do today.